Hello, you gorgeous individuals. It's Kav here, and today I'm here with my friends Kali Ray and Michelle. <laughs> so, we are here today to start a new series on my channel an anticipation series for Chain of Gold by Cassandra Clare, which is going to be her latest release in the never ending Shadowhunter <laughs> universe. And my friends have graciously agreed to be dragged into these videos with me. <laughs> this first episode is the Battle of the Shadowhunter Chronicles. I'm actually very excited about this one. I'm very proud of myself for coming up with this idea. I take all credit. It's a it. really good idea. Thank you, I tried. Back when Queen of Air and Darkness was being released, I did the same series in anticipation of Queen of Air and Darkness, and one of the videos I made for that was the TID versus TMI versus TDA tag, which is just a tag that has questions about all three series in the Shadowhunter Chronicles, and then you choose which series you would pick as the answer to that question. It was created by Emma from Emma Books, and it was done as a spin-off of the TID versus TMI tag, which I've also done. <laughs> so I will leave links to my versions of both of those videos in the description below as well as a link to Emma's version of the TID versus TMI versus TDA tag because she's the one who created that but we're going to be doing a little twist on that video each of us have been assigned a series so I have the infernal devices Kali Ray is the Mortal Instruments and Michelle is the Dark Artifices because those are our respective favorite series. Basically, we're going to be asking the questions from that tag, but we all have to defend why our series' answer would be the best answer, even if we don't believe that that's the right answer for the question. And we have to try to convince the others to cave to our point. And if you convince one of the other people to cave to your series, then you get the point for that question. And whoever has the most points by the end of the video wins. That was kind of a complicated explanation. <laughs> just watch the video. It'll be fun and chaotic. Yes. Don't pay attention to any of the rules of the game. Just watch this chaotic video. I don't know how many spoilers there are going to be in this video, but if there are potential spoilers, I will put a picture of the book that is being spoiled up on the screen. So just mute the video until that picture disappears or keep watching without muting and enter chaos. <laughs> Those are your options. Yes. So without further ado, let's get started. Question number one, who is the better main character, Clary, Tessa, or Emma? Oh god, so Clary is entering the shadow world with the reader and so it provides like a fun experience to go along with her and to figure out stuff with her. She doesn't necessarily have any like special powers besides being a shadow hunter and she has to learn it from scratch, which I feel like all of us like in our minds could imagine. Oh like we're secretly a shadow hunter and I feel like also like she doesn't automatically have any like fighting powers or anything like some people train for a day and then they just know how to fight all the time but she has to actually learn it and that's how like we would do so I feel like she's an identifiable character and she does make mistakes which everyone does See, the situation is, all those points that you said about Clary could be applied to Tessa, except Tessa is so much more likable, because <laughs> very few people actually like Clary. Like, I'm sorry Clary stands, but you are in the minority here. <laughs> Emma is a great main character. I love Emma. She's a badass. But with Tessa, it's the same thing where you're entering the world with her, so you're seeing the shadow world through her eyes, and she doesn't know what the hell's going on. She's out here in London as an American. She's stuck with some weird hot men. And she <laughs> makes the best of it even though she's stuck with a bunch of disasters. Like, basically everyone she meets is rude to her. Will is an <laughs> asshole. Jessamine's an asshole. Jem is dying. Jem is alive! Oh my god! <laughs> And Tessa's really doing her best. Tessa is an avid reader, which all of us are, so all of us have an immediate relation to Tessa, which can't be said for either of the other main characters. And also, unlike the other main characters, Tessa's not a boring old shadow hunter. She's the first of her kind. She is half shadow hunter, half demon. She's so powerful. And I think we all need to acknowledge that Tessa is going to be on her period for the rest of eternity. So I think by default, she should get this point for having to live that reality that no one wants to experience. Experience. Okay, so to be fair, your arguments are all about relatability, but like I have to be honest here and say that I only did read the graphic novels of the entire <laughs> And throughout the entirety of the graphic novel, Tessa's entire reaction to everything was just like... 
fucked. <laughs> Which I mean relatable. <laughs> but all she did was stare for like the whole book. And like for Clary, Clary's just really dumb. Like I'm really sorry. Clary has been jumping into so many mm. dumb things. But then what I really love about Emma is that she's chaotic dumbass just like everyone else. But she does chaotic dumbass so well. She manages to be competent chaotic dumbass. Point. I feel like there's something about Emma that like doesn't need to be relatable to be likable. You look at Emma and you're like, I want to be her. Like I'm not her right now, but I want to be her. I want to be that level of chaotic dumbass. Like I'm already chaotic dumbass, but I'm like not near that level yet and I want to be there. <laughs> this is a point, but I would like to bring it back to Tessa will have to experience her period for the rest of eternity. <laughs> so I think we should all acknowledge the difficulties she has to endure like no other character on this list. I have no more words about Claire. <laughs> I kind of have to concede the period point though. You're right. That's yeah. a rough thing to go through. I have to concede. I think Kav won that I round. Won. I won because of Tessa's Amazing. Reproductive <laughs> difficulties. <laughs> Question number two. Who is the, the better Herondale? Will, Jace, or Kit? Guys, I have to argue Kit for this one because I mean like all the other Herondales are like really dramatic and I feel like dramaticness is a Herondale trait. Yes. Trademark. And I feel like Kit does it better than pretty much every other Herondale. Like he moved continents because the guy he liked wouldn't say I love you back. <laughs> we have to give him the points for dramaticness, really. So here's the thing, I don't like Will. <laughs> Okay, when I first read The Infernal Devices, I was baby. It was in my dark days of middle school. Oh no. <laughs> and I read The Infernal Devices and I hated Will with a burning passion. <laughs> and then when I read I realized it was because I related to him and I didn't want to accept that Will and I had similarities. Oh so God. I have since grown to have appreciation for the depth with which Cassandra Clare explores that character because Will does have like all the angst of a Herondale, the traditional angst. But then when you find out the reason for it, everything he has put himself through to save the people in his life, I'm sorry, but look at that man. Like look what he's done for the people. <laughs> the way he just kind of lets himself have a little bit of love with Jem because Jem's already dying is so heartbreaking. But he tried to make everyone viscerally hate him. He tried to make himself unlikable and he knew that he would have to live the rest of his life in pain and in suffering all because of a fake curse. And then even when he found out the curse was fake, when he found out Jem and Tessa were engaged, he instead would have sacrificed his happiness again after already sacrificing it for like the past five years for his best friend. I mean, look at that man! Wow, it seems like you really like him. <laughs> you were like, I don't like Will, and then you gave like a whole impassionate yeah. speech about Will. Okay, <laughs> it's Jace time. Jace is just amazing. <laughs> What an argument. <laughs> Top notch. <laughs> Brilliant. He's like so badass and he always like knows what to say and what to do in different situations. And he's just like an amazing pair of Atai with Alec sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, he's been through so much in his life too. He saw his father die before his eyes, but then sometimes realized it just be like that. <laughs> that that wasn't actually <laughs> true. He was lied to his whole life about who he was, and he was actually the son of a murderous psychopath. Oh, so was Kit. I feel like this describes and a lot of the hair in the old But Jace went through that, and he became a better person because of that, and he He's just a badass. Personally, I feel that Jace is very much the male version of Clary, but people let him get away with a lot of what he does because he's a male character. Mm. But like, he's also just as dumb and reckless as Clary is. No, I feel like Jace is more dumb and reckless than Clary. <laughs> well, to be fair though, I do agree with part of that, except Jace actually does have fighting training and a lot of this when is, Clary does dumb stuff, this is a she has no point. fighting <laughs> training and she just goes point. in she's like, I can do it. <laughs> Clary is <laughs> short and angry, that's all she is. <laughs> but see, the other thing about Jace is that he basically basically tried to have sex with Clary while he knew she was his sister. Mm. Okay, yeah, but fair point. Jace kissed his sister who was not his sister while he thought she was his sister. Exactly. <laughs> but are we arguing who is the better Herondale or who is the better person? I think you're arguing which Herondale is the best. Like, which yeah. is your favorite of these three men? Okay, so like, which, which man like, would you stand? Oh, which man would you stand? <laughs> I did think that Will was hot when reading the graphic novels because I'm a dumb straight girl. See, I'm a lesbian yeah. and I'm arguing for Will, so you know it's not just because of how hot he is. <laughs> I love how passionate you got. Like, the first thing you said was, you see, I don't like, like Will. Well. And then <laughs> you argue so passionately. Wait, so does Will win this one? Yeah. Sure, yeah. For being a good person. He's yeah. the only Herondale who's a really good person. I and I surprised. believe he's the best Herondale. Like, listen, I was gonna concede and give it to Kit, because Kit is actually my favorite of the Herondales, but oh, you guys really? conceded first, yeah. so I won. <laughs> best love triangle. Clary, Jason, Simon, Tessa, Jem, and Will, Emma, Julian, and Mark. 
socks. Emma Julian. These are not really at love triangles. triangles. Here's my defense. Clary Joyce and Simon and Emma Julian and Mark are at love triangles. I feel like the love triangle in TDA was more like Mark, Christina, and Kieran. Oh, well, they're not on the list, so <laughs> unfortunately. You have to argue Emma Julian and Mark. Godspeed. Yeah. Godspeed. Tessa, Jim, and Will are the best love triangle that has ever been created. This is just like a mutually agreed on point by society because we all understand the power of hair and gray stairs. Because this love triangle was so powerful for its time. It was written in a time before polyamory could really be written about. And Cassandra Clare has said that if she wrote TID now, she would have made the three of them in a polyamorous relationship. I'm pretty sure she said that. The love these three characters have for each other, it's not like one of those cases where two guys are going after a girl and they hate each other. No, these three people just love each other so damn much. They would all die for each other. Like, we all know Gemma and Will are in love. You can't convince me otherwise. And they're both in love with Tessa, and Tessa's in love with both of them. And it's so powerful because at its core, The Infernal Devices truly is a story of love. And you can't convince me otherwise because it's the story of the love between three characters who all come from these really horrifying backgrounds, but they find solace in each other. I mean, Jem is a disabled half Chinese character who also watched his parents get murdered right before his own eyes and he's dying, but he still manages to be one of the kindest people that has ever existed. And Will, he's basically trying to convince the whole world to hate him because he thinks that he's saving their lives. And Tessa was betrayed by who she thought was her brother. She's found out her entire life was a lie. These two characters who've all lived through so much tragedy, they find love in each other and they find solace in each other. Their ending is both heartbreaking but also heartwarming because Tessa actually gets her happy ending with both of them and it's like simultaneously the worst and best thing I've ever read in my entire life because they get their happy ending but they also all suffer in their own ways and that's how real life is. Wow. I have no argument with Simon <laughs> Jason Simon. <laughs> Cobb wins. See, I could argue it was Mark Kieran and Christina, but then like you gave me Mark, Julian, and Emma. <laughs> and plus like you can't have them all end up together because if Mark and Julian ended up together, that would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, okay, we'll we all win. have to see that point. <laughs> I'll accept that point. <laughs> I'm so proud of my work. God, Cobb is winning overwhelmingly. <laughs> Question four. Who is the best villain? Sebastian Morgenstern, Axel Mortman, yes. or... Annabelle Blackthorne. Yes. We can't argue. Do you know it's who? Zara. The wait, bad guy is Zara. Wait, where Come on. Phone. Where are you going? <laughs> Getting my phone to show the world that Sebastian is my lock screen. Well, but I hate choices him. were made. I'm gonna start <laughs> because Sebastian is the best villain ever written into writing. He is just terrifying. Like the minute he walks into a room, like after you know who he actually is, obviously, and he's showing his true colors. It's really scary. No matter how he is, even if he's sporadic in his decisions, he is terrifying because he can literally do anything and he has no moral line that he won't cross for anything. He has no like soul really and also just like the ending of how he died it just all came together so well and he was supposed to be a good human person but valentine screwed that up and created the biggest villain. He literally has no moral anything and that's what's terrifying about him and that's why he's such an engaging villain i'm trying so oh. hard to come up with an argument for axel morton <laughs> can i argue zara because she's more the bad guy i mean like Who's you can argue, argue zara. Zara. Annabelle. it was annabelle blackthorne you can argue zara um, fine but okay. <laughs> okay, she's arguing zara dearborn instead of annabelle because she's being annoying <laughs> zara dearborn okay firstly she's so representative of like all the idiots in this world right now that are screwing up everything for all of us when she first shows up you kind of look at her and you're like i don't like her i don't like her I I think she's dumb. I think she's just like some weird whiny teenage girl who doesn't know anything. And then it goes on and you're like, man, she really is a whiny teenage girl who doesn't know anything, but she's also a bigot. It continues and then you're like, oh my god, she's gonna win. She's gonna win because everyone likes dumb people who are bigots. Jesus Christ. And I feel like that really, really like reflects the state of today's society when you see people, their arguments aren't logical. They're just based on like fear mongering and things like that. And yet they win anyway because everyone's dumb and doesn't listen to logic and only fear mongering. And I feel like it's so reflective of today's society that she gets so far even though she's really not that smart. She's not intimidating. She's just a teenage girl who is dumb. And yet she makes it that far because she knows how to use people's fear against them. And it's really scary because it's so reflective of today's society because you look at her and you're like, this girl isn't threatening at all, but then you're like, wait a second, she is. Hang on. So she's so, like, so hard to come up with an argument for Axel. 
<laughs> so she just comes out of nowhere and then she undermines you and you're like shocked because you didn't expect her to make it this far but she does. You both made such good points. Originally I was gonna say I could concede to Sebastian but then Michelle went off on Zara. <laughs> Wait, I wanna I continue Zara Sebastian so a little much. bit because also Sebastian is just a mastermind at planning things. His thought process of how to win, it's so hard to beat him and if like Clary and Jace didn't have personal experience with him they would not have beaten him because he just is that smart and calculating. I can't go up on Axel more than <laughs> he, he has nothing going he's for him. Just, he's just going. a figurehead honestly. Like, <laughs> Axel Martin is doing his best and it's so bad he's not even a good villain. <laughs> Sebastian is a good villain because he's so competent but Zara is a good villain because so. she's not competent and like survives anyway and that makes you afraid. Originally I would have considered to Sebastian because Sebastian actually is my favorite villain of all time but then you went off on Zara I'm when you Zara. talk about how like she how she is like so representative of today's society. I feel like that was the entire point of the Dark Artifices. I'm sorry, I'm gonna concede to Zara. I respect that. It's true. She's a real-life villain, which in a way is scary. Yeah, too. like I love Sebastian as a villain, but when you think about like who would actually scare you, I feel mm -hmm. like Zara would be the person that scared me. Because like I just kick Sebastian in the balls and get out of there. <laughs> yeah. But like Zara would actually have power over me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You'd kick Zara in the balls and then she'd get up and you'd be like, God exactly. damn it. <laughs> oh crap. <laughs> Which series threat is the best? The Dark Army, the Clockwork Army, or the Parabatai Curse? Okay, <laughs> the Clockwork Army is so fucking creepy. Like you look at those weird robot things, you can't tell me you wouldn't be scared and run the other direction. Are you really gonna sit here and tell me you wouldn't run for your life if some automaton came up to you and said some weird cryptic ass thing. <laughs> Yeah, reading the books and seeing them, I was just kind of like, nope, 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 nope. Exactly. They're so creepy. Yes, the Dark Army is frightening. And yes, the Parabatai curse is frightening. Those are more like looming fears. They kind of hang over you. But the Clockwork Army is not only a looming fear. It's like you see a member of this weird automaton creature-esque thing and your heart just drops. Like you're like, oh shit, I gotta go, guys. <laughs> you see the clock and yeah. your brain goes, this is I'm out of here. I am yeah. currently in hell. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna argue the Dark Army now. One of the things that's so scary about them is that it's honestly people that you know. Like there was someone who his pair batai was turned into an Endarkened and he had to kill his pair batai and then killed himself because it was so gut-wrenching for him to do. It was a random character. Oh. <laughs> the scariest thing about the Dark Army is it's literally people you know. It could be people that you love, people you're related to, and they're the ones who you're fighting and it's not even them anymore. Like with the Blackthorns, their father was turned. And with Luke, Amethyst was turned, his sister. These are all people that you don't want to fight and so that makes it so much harder to see them doing dark things because it's also not even them anymore and they were turned and they don't have souls anymore and they've kind of suffered a fate worse than anything because like they don't even exist but they do at the same time and you have to fight that. Yeah, I can't argue the Parabatai curse. There's nothing going for it right now. <laughs> and I should go for the dark army for this one because yes! I mean, they were the basis of evil and Thule. And also like, you can kick a clockwork army guy. <laughs> can you really kick your Parabatai in the face? Bold of you to assume I wouldn't kick my Parabatai in the face. <laughs> To assume I wouldn't do it when they weren't even in and Darkened. <laughs> that is fair, but also like killing a robot versus killing your parabatai is like whatever. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Fine, whatever. You get the point. <laughs> you get like all the other points. So <laughs> better first book: Lady Midnight, oh. Clockwork Angel, or City of Bones. <laughs> Except it's the introduction to the Shadow World. But like, it's so bad. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I love Cassandra Clare with my whole entire heart, but City of Bones is a bad book, guys. I feel like Lady Midnight was like the most tight story. In terms of like being able to introduce a lot of characters to us and make us like them and identify with their struggles really, really quickly. I agree, but I would argue that Lady Midnight almost feels more of a continuation than a first book. Clockwork Angel mm, is true. truly a first book in a series because it has the same introduction feeling that City of Bones has because you're being introduced to the new world through Tessa's eyes but not only that you're being introduced to it in a new setting and in a new time period but it's still a much better written book than City of Bones and it's so much more powerful and it gets so much more done. That's true. Yeah I'm gonna have to concede that because I mean, it really is more of a too. continuation and then she needed to use the last book in the Mortal Instruments no. to set up the Dark Artifice yeah. as well too. I'm surprised I didn't think I was yeah. gonna win that one. I'm really? so proud of myself because really? Lady Midnight's actually my favorite. Uh, I would have voted for that one but you made a good 
point of that it's more of a continuation. It's not I'm necessarily really, yeah. a first you. book. I'm just like, making I don't shit think up yeah. as I go. I think because you, you could read The Infernal Devices without having read The Mortal Instruments, mm -hmm. and you could read oh, The Mortal yeah. Instruments without reading that, but you cannot read, read the, dark the Dark Artifices. artifices. <laughs> Question 7, favorite female supporting character. Isabel Lightwood, Cecily Herondale, or Christina Rosales? Wow, this is a difficult one, Christina's honestly. Christina's the best one, obviously. She's a person of color learning <laughs> English for the first time, <laughs> and manages to be a badass female supporting character. Also, she gets to bang two hot fairies, and that's wonderful. I'm proud of her. <laughs> Christina, badass. Isabel, badass. Love them both. But the other series really only have one primary strong female supporting character. The Infernal Devices has two. It has a Sophie Collins and Cecily Herondale. Oh, also Charlotte. Yeah. The Infernal Devices has three. Sophie is basically Tessa's best friend, so she's basically like the Isabel or the Christina to Tessa. But then Cecily also comes into the mix. So the Infernal Devices has the most female supporting characters, and it's also a story that's set in the Victorian era. So this is a time when sexism is so rife, and Cassandra Clare said fuck sexism, and instead said women rights. Can we just talk about how badass Charlotte Branwell is? Like, why don't we ever talk about Charlotte. The Infernal Devices has more than one female supporting character. It has the most female supporting characters and that's especially powerful because it's written in a time period where sexism was so rife and so many authors give in to the bigotry of their time period but Cassandra Clare did the exact opposite. And even if you take Charlotte and Sophie out of the mix and you just argue for Cecily, Cecily herself is so powerful and she's basically the entire reason Isabel Lightwood became who she is because Isabel Lightwood is descended from Cecily Herondale. Cecily was the original Isabel. Oh god, I'm trying to argue my point. <laughs> Isabel is a badass and she is like unapologetically who she is. She doesn't care what anyone so else Cecily. says about her. <laughs> Let <thing>. me argue. <laughs> she doesn't care what anyone says about her. She does what she wants in a smart way. Also, she just like wears heels to fight and that's really badass. And she uses a whip as her weapon, which is just awesome. And she just is amazing. And she just knows like who she is and is very, very strong, but also can be vulnerable at the same time. And she's not ashamed of any part of herself. Yeah, but I still feel like Christina would trump everyone just because she would be able to kick all these other female characters ass. But <laughs> your point about the heels, but Cecily and all the women in the Victorian era can fight in those stupid ass big Victorian dresses. So True. that's even more powerful than Neither just the that. heels. The Infernal Devices is a story of different types of female power. It's not just being badass the way Cecily is, but it's also a kind of soft strength that Sophie has. That's true, but Christina kind of embodies both at once. That is a fair point. Also, she gets to bang two fairies at once. <laughs> that's a fair point, but Cecily marries her brother's mortal enemy. <laughs> so, oh, true. That's like definitely that some guts. <laughs> that was some power. And also, Sophie, even though like she could have been with Gideon and just gotten power and status, she still waited until like it was actually like a respectful duo. She wouldn't have just married him for the sake of having power and status. And Charlotte, like just, I don't even need to talk about Charlotte because Charlotte is so powerful. The Infernal Devices really is a story of women supporting women when you think about it. Yeah, I'll save this for the network of women supporting women. Yeah, you don't really get too. that in TDA. You know what? I, I mean, really wanted that network though. I wanted Livy and Drew to be friends so bad. And I feel like they're like, going to be. I really thought you were going to win this too. I was so close to saving I to Christina. Know. I was really like, going and then you were like you were christina. like the network of women supporting women and i was like oh, oh yeah like, yeah, yeah actually because i was like i we love christina go so one. much which is the better setting the new york institute the london institute or the los angeles institute actually the setting was what really really made me like tda the most i really like the ocean scenery and stuff so like la is my jam so then she was like i'm gonna have a book in la and i was like yes and then i read it and it was like so nice and pretty and then like they had like the institute next to the ocean but like and emma and julian like, also had sex on a beach yeah but that's like a bonus point Point. The sand! Like, how did they maneuver that? Because they're good at what they do! <laughs> the thing about the Infernal Devices is it's so atmospheric. Like, when I read The Mortal Instruments and The Dark Artifices, it feels contemporary, like it feels like it's right yeah. now and I could be there. But The Infernal Devices truly is like entering a different world. It takes place not only like on a different continent, but in a different time period. It's like a different atmosphere. It's so atmospheric yeah. and powerful. New York and Los Angeles are so contemporary and they're so right now and i'm just like sometimes you don't want right now sometimes you read for escapism and yeah. the informal devices is so easy to find that escapism but also to find reality and it has that dynamic more than the other two series do yeah i agree with that because also like i live in la so i like have that already in my mind and like i grew up at the beach and so reading it i was kind of like oh like 
it's my home. That's cool. But also, like, I want they're to supposed to be else. there. And then when I go home, they're not there. <laughs> New York is so fun and cool. And it's fun to imagine this big, huge institute in the middle of New York City. But I have to concede that point that London is just very atmospheric. And London is amazing. All right. Okay. Yeah. I, I won. Question nine. Better last book. City of Heavenly Fire, Clockwork Princess, or Queen of Air and Darkness? God. This Aww. is difficult. God I lost this one. <laughs> this is so bad. I can't, okay. I can't argue Queen of Air and Darkness because I kind of hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Queen of Air and Darkness and City of Heavenly Fire are both good books. I enjoyed them both. They're also both not as conclusive as a true conclusion because they both are leaving room for a continuation. The Wicked Power starts directly from the ending of Queen of Air and Darkness. Yeah. And City of Heavenly Fire, it's a good ending, but I would even argue that City of Heavenly Fire isn't even the best book in the Mortal Instruments series, City of Glasses. No, City of Lost Souls. So, but even you agree that City of Heavenly Fire isn't the best book. Yeah. So if it's not even the best book in the series, how could it be the best ending? Clockwork Princess really just tugs at your heartstrings and like makes you go through it. And that's what I like in an ending. I like for books to be escapism, but like I also like for them to explain the reality that you can find happiness even in a not perfect ending. Because life doesn't conclude perfectly. It concludes messily, but these characters still find their happy endings within that messy ending. You're not gonna sit here and tell me that you weren't bawling at 3 a.m. when you were reading Clockwork Princess. None of you can convince me that you were not doing that because everyone was bawling at 3 a.m. That's true. I read the graphic novel and it did make me sad. I was exactly. like, what's happening? Even what? my dad cried and he doesn't cry. See? Collier's dad cried so that alone should get Clockwork Princess the point. Yeah. I think you've already won this though because neither of yeah. us can really like... I, can't. I mean, I like, guess there's... City of Heavenly Fire is a really good final book. Like in my opinion, it's a good final book but just... Clockwork Princess. Clockwork Princess is on another it's, level. The, yeah, there's no competition. Yeah, I can't argue Queen of Air and Darkness at all, man. Question number 10. <laughs> Best final epilogue, City of Heavenly Fire, Clockwork Princess, or Queen of Air and Darkness? Do we even need to argue that? I could I argue, but I feel like this. everyone can agree that Clockwork Princess is the best yeah. epilogue. So I think I'm we already did this. Point. <laughs> yeah. I'm taking the point. I'm yeah, snatching Clockwork it from Princess. you guys. Clockwork Princess is the most powerful epilogue. Every single page of it. I was crying. So the so point much. belongs to me. Yeah. So let's look at our results. Yeah. I, won. I wonder who won. Collier got one point. Yay. Well, Michelle got one point. Yay. And I got eight whopping <laughs> points. Of course, because oh, the infernal device is the best. Easily. There were times when I didn't even agree with myself, <laughs> but I just kept arguing my point until you guys agreed with me. That's but true. to be fair, kind of disadvantaged because I didn't read the real book, so... Mm -hmm. That's I'm your problem. Like, like, there were actually, like, so many of these where, in when I did the tag, like, I actually picked the Dark Artifices as my answer. And I think it actually ended up winning in that video, so I was surprised. Interesting. I was just very steadfast. Like, there were times <laughs> when I was like, I don't even agree with me. Why do they agree with me? But I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> you were like, I don't even like Will. Why is Will winning? Exactly. <laughs> it's like a 10 minute speech. I hope you all enjoyed this chaotic mess of a video. I'm so excited to edit it. I've been so excited about this video idea, so I'm very glad we finally got a chance to do it, and I hope you all like the final product, no matter how messy it is. I hope you guys liked this first episode in the series. Again, I'll link my original versions of this video and Emma's version in the description below, so you can check that out, and stay tuned for the rest of this series. Thank you both so much for, Thanks for agreeing with us. me, for conceding yeah. to all my points. <laughs> I will link Collier's bookstagram that she posts on, like, once in a millennium. I will try to continue it. Michelle's an artist. I'll link her Instagram in the description below as well. So check out these lovely people's Instagrams. And check out mine as well because I post on all my other social medias more often than on my channel. So check those out. Yeah. And thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a like and subscribe because that stuff makes me happy. Go ahead and comment down below and tell us if you think I deserve to win. Tell us who you would have picked as the winner for these questions. Yeah. And with that, that's all. We'll see you all for the next episode of the Chain of Gold Anticipation series. Bye!